Mackin Island. Fudge, horses, lilacs, the fork, it's a great place to visit. Kristen was there to find out what it's like to live there during the winter. You know, it's a, it's a special place every single season. And we'll talk with Michigan DNR Fisheries Research Biologist Troy Zorn for an update on the Bays de Noc fish assessment that's been going on since 2009. Several things have been improving a little bit over the last few years and that's kind of nice to see. Don't go anywhere. It's Monday night and time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Mackinac Island, one of the most popular tourist destinations in Michigan in the summer. During the peak summer months, the island sees up to 15,000 visitors a day. In the winter, Mackinac Island becomes a quiet, isolated home to about 500 year-round residents. I wanted to find out what life was like on the island during this quieter season. You know, people in the summer, they say, what's it like living on Mackinac? What's it like living on Mackinac in the winter? It's a magical place. I had only one option of getting to this magical place when I was there in early March. The ferries were not running. The wind was so high it blew all the ice in the lake over to St. Ignace so they couldn't get the boats out. Um, so that's why you don't see a boat now. There's too much ice over there. <laughs> and this winter wasn't cold enough for the ice bridge to form for snowmobiles to cross. So I took the five minute flight from St. Ignace to Mackinac Island. Headed to Mackinac if the boats are not running, the airport is a very, very busy place. It's the only point to get on or off the island for people, for freight, uh, so like postal service, uh, packages, uh, all of our food comes through the airport. Uh, so it's a pretty important place on the island, especially in winter once the boats stop. The first thing I noticed when I walked inside the airport were snowmobile helmets scattered everywhere. They belong to residents who left their snowmobile while they went to the mainland. Everybody rides around on a snowmobile. It's just how you get around. It's how you get to work, to school, how you get your groceries. There are no motorized vehicles allowed on the island during the summer months. Since 1898, motorized vehicles have been prohibited, except for emergency vehicles. Snowmobiles have been a winter way of life, though. I prefer to snowmobile as a first responder. I get there a lot quicker. <laughs> Some people walk, which is great. There's a lot of cleared paths for us. Some folks have the fat tire bikes, which is easier to ride in the snow. And then we also have people who like to ski to town or they'll snowshoe to town. I've seen that coming from the village on their snowshoes or on their skis, the cross country skis. And then we also have a lot of groomed trails too on the east side for cross country skiing and snowshoeing. The Mackinac Island Airport is roughly two miles from the downtown area. Since it was a beautiful, unusually warm day and all downhill, I strapped on my snowshoes and hiked to town. As I walked, I met only a few snowmobiles and a taxi. The island is famous for its horses and they are also year-round residents. I dropped my overnight bag off at the Pontiac Lodge, one of the few motels open all year, and met up with a year-round islander for a snowmobile ride to her favorite spot. I am Danielle Van Winkle and I live on Mackinac Island year-round. I have since 2016, so this would be my fourth winter. I work at Main Street Inn and Suites. I'm also a volunteer firefighter on the island. This is my favorite spot right here, Sunset Rock. Especially in the winter, I like to come up and see what the lake's looking like, see what the ice conditions are, you know, if the boat's gonna run or if it's not gonna run. We can try to predict just by the ice conditions that we can see. 
Everyone comes up here in the summer to see the sunsets and they're beautiful. You get a great view of the bridge. You can see Mackinac City, you can see St. Ignace. It's just a really great spot all year round, but especially in the winter. <laughs>pretty much closed up this time of year. It's a good time of year for a lot of people to do construction work and work done on their stores. In the afternoon, I met up with another year-round resident, Heather May, for a stroll through town. This would be the third store that stays open. And they're actually still family owned and operated. So that's our hardware store, but that's where we go to get our gas for snowmobiles. Let's see, if we go down this way, we'll head to the marina. One thing you can see, the water is now touching the bottom of the docks and whatnot. That's been sort of an issue this year. The water level's been raising. That's something we, we've been having to combat this past year. Heather owns one of the many fudge shops on the island. So there's actually a total of five generations of candy makers in my family. Uh, I'm a fourth generation and uh, it was started with my great grandfather in 1881. Uh, we actually started in Atchison, Kansas. Um, we moved up here though with my grandfather in 1940 um, and we've been in the same location ever since. So um, everything inside is pretty close to the same as it was when it, we started. And so from my grandfather, my father took over, and then from my father I took over, uh, along with my older siblings. So um, we make all the candy we sell. Um, I'm pretty proud about being able to keep the tradition going. So yeah, we make, well obviously our main thing is fudge, but I would say our, our main things are fudge, peanut brittle, English toffee, we make large turtles, we call them monsters. We make divinity, we make chocolate clusters, so we make a lot. <laughs> I definitely wanna keep the family business going, so that's my main goal. Um, and I love teaching at the school, so I definitely could see myself here for quite a while. I like being here year round because it's so nice and calm and quiet in the winter. For me, I personally enjoy um, hiking and doing photography as my hobby, so I'll go on a lot of walks and take pictures and whatnot. This is when the island catches its breath and residents enjoy a little extra time to be a community. A lot of the community members come out together, get to see each other again, um, and you walk into a restaurant downtown and, and you know everybody in there. It's like getting your family room back. You know, you, you all play pinball, pool uh, together and sit down, have a meal. It's the only time of year that we get to do that. In the summer, it's nearly impossible to see the people you know and, and hang out with your friends. Now, someone told me once before I did my first winter, she said, if you are bored, it's your own fault because there's so much to do here. Um, we have bingo on Tuesday nights. Uh, we have trivia night on Friday nights. We have a music Monday where it's like a jam session Monday nights and I go to that. There's not one night of the week I don't think something's going on. Let's see, there's stained glass window class, there's cooking classes, there's dancing classes. So, I, I mean, really, you could be as, as busy as you wanna be and fill up your schedule if you wanted to. It's totally possible. <laughs> In the winter, there are no fudge shops open, no gift shops, and only two restaurants. So why would anyone want to visit Mackinac Island in the winter? I'd just say it's a whole different world, you know, um, than what you'd see in uh, in the summertime. And uh, it's a, like I say, if you're looking for just a little peace and quiet, you know, this is this is it in the wintertime. Yeah, you get out into the woods with this pair of snowshoes or a pair of skis, you won't find anything like it. It's very quiet, yeah, you can hear the waves on the shore. In the summer, there's so much noise everywhere, just, just from people walking in the street and the horses. And in the winter, if the wind is still, uh, you can hear, you can hear a, a twig snap on Round Island across the streets. It's pretty amazing. Not too many people get to experience that.
If you come to Mackinac Island in the winter, visit on one of the first Saturdays of the month when the state park hosts their turtle trek, a lantern-lit self-guided cross-country ski and snowshoe trail on the east side of the island. Because Mackinac Island is known as Turtle Island, or Michel Mackinac translates to Great Turtle Island, which is what we are. If you look at the island from a ways away out in the, a boat in the water, it, it looks like a turtle. It looks like a turtle's back coming out of the water. And so we adopted the name to the ski event. We do about three night skis a winter. Uh, we do one in early January, early February, and early March. We uh, set up kerosene lanterns, about a mile and a half groomed trail. Takes you around some of the more distinct spots on Mackinac Island, such as Arch Rock and uh, Sugarloaf. And it just it meanders through some of the, I just say, some of the most beautiful woodlands we have on the island here. And it's just a really neat experience to be able to get out in the woods and just enjoy the, the quiet of the winter in the woods. It's, uh, it's an experience I've always really enjoyed. We always have a fire going, we have a little hot chocolate, some s'mores, good company. And uh, it's just a really inviting opportunity to get out into the outdoors. But you get to see a, a couple of more popular spots on the island through this trail. You get to stop at Arch Rock as well. Take in the, the scene, because you're, you're about, a, it's about 150 feet up in the air, over the water, over the looking the sheer cliff straight down, and then it's, it's water. The island was peaceful. People visit Makna Island to experience the olden day charm of it. It is even more quaint and storybook-like in the winter. It's hard to describe the feeling it brings you. These quieter days won't last much longer. Spring was near when I was on the island, and soon it would explode with preparations for summer. You know, that, that excitement of the spring and everything is new and starting over again, you know? And uh, so I always kind of, I always look forward to it. April around here is just a, a flurry of activity. Start, you know, getting the shutters off. There's a lot of cleaning and just getting the water turned on and getting it woke back up, you know, from winter slumber. When you prepare for spring, you prepare for summer and you're preparing for fall. Uh, you're always trying to prepare one season ahead. You know, there's a, a little bit of feeling of overwhelm, you know, just everything you've got to do, but somehow you know it's all gonna get done because it happens every year. <laughs> so you kind of just stick to your guns and uh, you take one day at a time. You try to get as much done in a day as you possibly can because uh, sometimes the winters run late and they seem to run right into summer. And then all of a sudden, you know, one week you'll have snow on the ground, six inches, and we're shoveling out Fort Mackinac. And then that weekend, it'll be 60 degrees and there will be hundreds of tourists coming out of the island. End of April, we'll start getting a lot of employees coming in for like the bigger resorts, like the Grand and Mission Point. They start to get their employees in end of April, early May. Um, the first two weekends in May are typically when all of the businesses will start opening up. This year we'll probably open around the third week of May. We tend to open a little later just because I teach at school and um, just getting both things going is a little tougher. I, I'm usually the one who gets all the candies made at the beginning and then once we get our candy makers up here then we can start training them and they can kind of take over from there and I can just run it. <laughs> You know, it's a, it's a special place. Every single season, it offers something completely new. And so there's, there's a lot of versatility here. Uh, it's a lot of fun to live here. It's, it's hard, but it's, it's really enjoyable as well.
recently received an update about the ongoing fish community assessment in the nearshore waters of Northern Lake Michigan and Michigan's portion of Green Bay. I talked with DNR Fisheries Research Biologist Troy Zorn for an explanation. Since 2009, we've done an a annual survey of uh, fish populations in Big and Little Bay to Knock, and then we also sample um, Lake Michigan near the ports of Menominee, Cedar River, Manistique, and Naubin Way. And um, we've been doing it since 2009. It's a standard gill net assessment. We do it to basically get a picture of what the fish community is like in each of these areas. Our gill nets have a variety of mesh sizes ranging from one inch to five inches. So we catch things from alewife all the way up to lake sturgeon or, or large walleye and pike. Um, we also use a 3 16th mesh, they call it micro mesh, and that allows us to get an index of how many young perch are produced each year. So from that, we can get a picture of how abundant each species is, what the size structure is. We get aging samples from fish, so scales or spines from the game fish, and that allows us to tell how abundant each of the different age groups is. And, and then over time, you can track the population. You can track uh, different age groups from one year to the next basically describe how the fish community is changing in, in the area that you sample. But we're only there in August, so fish move in and out of these areas. So we're getting a snapshot um, at one time of the year, but through time you get an index to tell us if we think the population levels are going up or down through time, or if they're changing, or if new species are moving in, some are disappearing over time. We can look at how the walleye population has been trending through time in terms of abundance in each of the areas that we survey. You know, for example, in um, Big and Little Bay to Knock, it's kind of neat that the abundance levels in one bay track the abundance level in the other, which suggests to me that our survey is doing a pretty good job of tracking abundance and also that something at a large scale is, is affecting how abundant those populations are, you know, across this area of Northern Lake Michigan. Since about 2004, our, our catches of walleye have been fairly stable. We usually do catch more in Little Bay Knock. It's got a considerably larger population, but the populations in both areas have been slowly trending upwards, uh, which, is, which is a good sign. Um, and we've seen a similar pattern in uh, Menominee and Cedar River, where we typically also catch walleye. Uh, that, that southern part of the bay is pretty, I think it's fairly well influenced by what's going on in the Fox River and, and the southern Wisconsin rivers, which are really productive walleye fisheries. It's moving in the right direction, I think, from an angler's perspective. Just to give you a little update on the sport fishery in, in the bays, and there's been a, a creel census happening since, I think, 1985. They've been sampling Little Bay to Knock almost year-round every year. There's been a long-term decline in sport fishing effort on the bays, and which has happened in a lot of the Great Lakes areas of uh, Great Lakes waters in Michigan. Um, but the last couple of years, actually 2018, 19, we've seen an uptick in the amount of uh, angling effort on the bays. So that's been kind of encouraging. And also the walleye harvests, I'm um, just looking at them um, in 19, 2018 and 19, they were some of the best that we've seen in the last 10 years. So I think that's maybe helped to get a little bit more of anglers out there um, targeting walleye. I know we've had some really good reports. Perch have also been um, trending up in, in both bays since about 2016. So for the last four years, it looks like our valleys have been starting to creep up. And we have had higher perch catches in, in Little Bay to Knock, um, like between 2010 and 2014, we had higher catches. But again, the, the, you know, seeing the abundance going up, that's a good sign. Of course, these nets, especially for perch, will catch um, proportionately more smaller fish than, than larger ones. So we are, in some sense, maybe tracking the smaller fishes more so with these nets than the larger fishes. But I think when you see the overall trend going up, I think that's what, what an angler would like to see, and that's kind of what our data are showing. Um, smallmouth bass fishing, catch rates for smallmouth bass, and the harvest have kind of crept up some over the last decade also. So it kind of ties in a little bit with that water clarity changes and the gobies starting to get to be a situation where smallmouth bass are, are maybe benefiting from some of those changes. And the pike fishing has been pretty good the last couple of years too with those, uh, with the higher water levels. We've heard a lot of reports of, of good pike fishing um, in the bays. So that, so pretty good news, I think, on the sport fishing front. Uh, things are, several things have been improving a little bit over the last few years and that's kind of nice to see and who knows where it'll go next year. And, as long as we're all sit here, sitting here cooped up in our homes, at least we know it's good to know that the fish are still out there in the lake. So 
when we can get elk, hopefully they'll still be there for us to, uh, to go after. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.